This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 25th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, the first two of our top three issues focus on the big things missing so far from this year's fiscal discussion. First, a 10-year outlook so that Alaskans can grasp the longer-term concerns facing us and the options available to us. Second, a discussion of all the new revenue options and how they would affect various Alaskans not just PFD cuts. And our third issue is our concern about the growing inconsistency of some around the Senate finance table as we discuss various budget categories. And now let's join Michael. Let's talk a little bit here about, uh, you know, your weekly top three. We've got two for one, actually. One and two are kind of lumped together. Uh, and I think when it's all said and done, um, I I couldn't agree more. This is something that I've been talking about for years. Number one is kind of this lack of long-term vision uh, that I think past legislatures, and I think this one is, is kind of already showing us, they are not thinking beyond... I don't know if it's the next election cycle or what, but it doesn't seem like anybody is really looking at that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And your number one is they're also not looking at the 10 year outlook. Where is the 10 year outlook? Give us uh, give us some of the reasoning behind uh, you, you, you thinking that's a number one issue here. Yeah, sometimes sometimes the top three are, are about what we're talking about in the room this time. The first two, as you said, are, are what we're not talking about uh, in the room, but we should be talking about in the room. One of the things that an administration is is required to do by statute um, each December when they when they propose the budget is also to put a 10 year plan, put out a 10 year plan right. that shows the consequences of that budget. Uh, neither the Walker administration uh, in their preliminary uh, budget nor the Dunleavy administration in the in their redo of the Walker budget in December did that, and the Dunleavy administration hasn't done it since. And I think that's really created a vacuum in the room uh, that that is, that's important and that is affecting the discussion. Usually in a 10-year budget, you see, you see what's going on. You see changes in revenue over the 10 years, and you see changes in costs over, over the 10 years, and you can put each year in context and understand what you need to be doing that year to prepare yourself for the for the coming ten years, for example, uh, back in the late uh, uh, well in the early 20 teens, 2011, 2012, you could see oil production declining and you could see oil revenue declining, and and so we talked about what the issues were in that, um, and and the Aces tax uh, uh, approach was was a big issue in that, and we corrected it uh, with SB 21. In 2013, this year, without having without having that 10-year budget in front of us, uh, or that 10-year uh, uh, plan in front of us, we're, we're, we're sort of shooting in the dark. And 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 this is a particularly important year that we shouldn't be shooting in the dark. One of the things, if you look at the 10-year, if you look at the 10-year plan, the last 10-year plan that was published for last year. Uh, one of the things that you really that leaps out at you is what's going on with PERS and TERS. The approach we've taken on PERS and TERS, <coughs> excuse me, since 2013, is what's called a level percent approach. And under that approach, the cost of PERS and TERS, the contribution toward PERS and TERS, ramps up each year. Right. It's sort of a it's sort of a, a low buy-in number, and then each year it gets increasingly bigger. 
if we had if we had the ten year budget uh, for this year, we would see the same thing. And and frankly, PERS and TERS is increasing at a rate of something like eight percent per year. That's what it was doing in the in the last ten year plan we saw. So by the time you get to the tenth year, PERS and TERS now is somewhere in the two hundred million dollar range. By the time you get out to the tenth year, it's in the four hundred million dollar range. Right. There there are other cost items that are doing that. So what you see is and you see fairly flat revenues and so what you see with that 10-year budget is costs going up revenues staying relatively flat across that time and and a cost squeeze uh occurring uh as you get to those out years so you so what we ought to be doing this year uh is is saying okay we've got to get costs down and we've got to start making sure that other costs keep going down going forward because we've got to account for PERS and TERS going up at a rate uh, uh, four times four times the rate of inflation uh, over the next 10 years. And that would that would lead you to, 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 to look at things like the university budget and the K-12 budget in, in a much different light than I think than I think they're being looked at right now. They're just looking being looked at in a single year. And saying, oh well, we just, you know, we need to, we need to find room to squeeze these in. We need to, you know, find new revenues and and squeeze these in for this year. But the problem is, if you're if you're able to look at a ten year plan, you can see it's not just this year's problem. It's next year's and the years after that and the year all the way out through the ten year through the ten year cycle. And you need to be doing things. You need to be telling K through twelve, for example. Okay, we may not cut you as bad this year, but you're going to have to take. <coughs> you're going to have to take some more reductions uh, going forward through the next few years, next few years, or localities, you're going to have to get ready to take more of this burden through the next two, two, through, through a few years, because we've got to account and get ready for this fact that PERS and TERS, among other costs, are going to be escalating rapidly. Not having that 10-year budget in the room, not being able to, to talk about that and see that and see where the trends are going I think is putting this legislature at a huge, huge disadvantage, um, and and I think it's putting this debate at a huge, huge disadvantage because we're just talking about these single year numbers as opposed to what we're facing in the future. Uh, let's rewind for a second, Brad. Brad Keithley, by the way, is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, did was this a mandate? Was the ten year plan was that part of the you know statutory budgetary process, or was this a planning tool, or or uh, oh, it's a man. It's a mandate. The statute says you shall publish. Yeah. So, a so plan. yeah. So the question is, where is it? Uh, uh, because I, quite honestly, and I don't understand why the Dunleavy administration wouldn't put it out because it would essentially bolster their opinion across the board of, hey, the, the yogurt's about to hit the wall. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we take a look at this? Well, the original justification for not putting it out was that Walker hadn't left one behind, and in December, all the Dunleavy administration was doing was really just republishing the Walker spending plan with uh, with uh, uh, the the new revenues that the Dunleavy administration came out of. That that excuse, that justification, sort of fails when you get to the to the point of the new uh, Dunleavy budget, and and you know putting that together. Tenure plans are difficult. And if the if the if the Walker administration hadn't done the groundwork, that means there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done to put it together. But I, to me, it's a critical budget tool. It's it's frankly one of the first things that I go look for when the, when the budget comes out. Uh, and one of the things that I sort of keep up in a tab on my screen as as I'm doing budget work because you've got to understand the context in which any given year um, is falling. So I, I, I have heard that the Dunleavy administration is working on it. Um, frankly, if I were them, I would put it out sooner than, than later. And even if all I did was put out what Walker should have put out, which is the 10-year outlook based upon the Walker spending uh, plan, and, and frankly, that's easy to do. I've already done that. It's up on it's up on. Uh, uh, up on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, in one of our posts, it, even if even that's if that's all you do, just put the ten year outlook on 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 where Walker would have had it. You can see these holes, you can see these problems uh, developing as you go through, and and you can see what you need to be doing this year to get ready uh, for the future years. I absent that tool, I, there's just a there's just a gap 
uh, in the discussion, and I think I think the state is worse off because of it. Well, I would agree with that. Again, I think that this, uh, you know, we need that necessary planning and without the tools to do so, uh, nobody's really going to be thinking about that or have it in the back of their mind. And, and, it, and of course, as, we, as we've been talking about, painting this long-term fiscal future of, hey, guys, if we don't get our poop in a group here, this is going to be very, very difficult and, uh, and, and catastrophic, I think, potentially for the state of Alaska, especially looking at some of the comments and the latest story this morning. I don't know if you caught it uh, this morning. Uh, the House coalition, uh, you know, the, the agreement for the coalition is likely going to kill, uh, you know, the permanent fund payback, let alone the PFD, uh, full size PFD and more. So I'm a little concerned about what is going to be happening moving forward. I'm not nearly as rosy in my outlook uh, as I was in thinking there was some potential that we would get some of these big cuts in here because all I'm seeing is, you know, hashtag resist right now uh, for the governor's plan. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And 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 some of that, I mean, go, goes back to the absence of a 10-year plan. You can argue hashtag, you know, resist and say we need to keep this spending going and we need to keep these programs going. <laughs> Excuse me. When all you're talking about is uh, is is the is a one year is a one year look and say, look, you know, we can we can paper over this, or you know, we've got the CBR to get us through through another year of this, and 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 all and all that sort of thing. But if you look at the ten year plan, and if you look at where we're headed on the cost side, and where we're headed uh, uh, with with realistic oil prices. And even with you know projected increases in production uh, from some of the new projects, if when you look at that ten-year plan, you go, look, it, we, we I mean, yeah, maybe we could paper over this one more year, but there's just no way we can keep this charade going for ten years. And we need to get serious about we need to get serious about some of these cuts. So I th I think there's a real loss in the room by not having that ten-year look. Uh, as part of the context, I mean, I think, uh, frankly, I'm I'm surprised, as 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 you just said, I'm surprised the administration hasn't do it, hasn't done it. If I were the OMB director, I would want to have that, and be able to say, yeah, we can argue about this year, but look at what's happening to us in years four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We can't, we and and look at what's happened to our fiscal reserves, right? And 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 we just don't have the capacity to do this anymore. We need to be making these changes, maybe. Maybe, you know, as we get toward the end game, people can say, well, maybe we don't make them all this year, but these changes need to be made in the next two years or in the next three years because we can't keep the charade going. Yeah. Even if you even if you say the earnings reserve account is one of my friends uh, try, uh, often comments, oh, the earnings reserve account is another savings account. Well, even if you say that, you shouldn't because it's a tax on future Alaskans. But even if you say that, we can't keep the charade going more than three or four years uh, using that uh, when you look at the 10-year plan. So it's a it's something that's missing in the room, um, and and frankly, uh, for my money, uh, is is a critically important piece that needs to be added to the room. Let's crack into number two for just a minute here. We can tease it and then jump into uh, jump into the break and then come back to it. Uh, the discussion of all revenue options are important, but it seems like. Um, Senator von Imhoff, and, well, and several others, quite honestly, uh, including uh, Senator Stevens and others, have all basically kind of laser focused in. And all we see them talking about now is cutting the PFD. This is what happens when you have a budget that looks like this and you still want to pay a PFD. You, you still want us to give you a PFD. No, wait a minute. Yeah. So I, I know I know people listen to this program and I know people that I, that I that I interact with um, uh, in, in, in day to day routine say, you know, cuts first. We're not going to talk about revenue until we new revenue until we make these cuts. Well, folks, they're they're talking about new revenue. If you if you listen to Senator Von Emhoff, every every hearing uh, is 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 always about. You know, we wouldn't be having these discussions. We wouldn't be having these problems uh, if we if we just, you know, would put the PFD on the table. Uh, her, her latest phrase is we don't have a fiscal crisis. We have a priority crisis. We shouldn't be prioritizing the PFD. We should be cutting it down uh, and we can afford we can afford this sort of we can afford this sort of budget. Um, and, and and folks, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to tell you 
that new revenues are on the table. They're on the table every day. They're being discussed every day. Uh, and those new revenues are PFD cuts, PFD taxes. There are there are much better ways if we got to have new revenues. And and if if you if you've been listening to the debate, you know we're going to end up with new revenues of some sort. If we've got to have new revenues, um, uh, there are much better ways than to do it through PFD taxes. And by holding ourselves back and not putting those on the table and not having them part of the discussion. Uh, then, frankly, I think uh, uh, we're both we're both not getting a full picture of what's going on with the budget, and and we're just giving the field over to those who want to make PFD cuts. They're having a field day because there's nobody out there challenging them or coming up with with different proposals. Yep, absolutely. Harold says Von Imhoff should remove all doubt and say we don't want our rich family to be hit by a tax. I mean, that's part of the problem. We've got the top, you know, one percent, five percent, all the top twenty percent are definitely uh, uh, afraid. Although, I don't know, this 20% number, 65,000 or more a year is apparently the 20% nationwide. I don't know what it is in Alaska, but, uh, I mean, a significant portion of the of the uh, legislature is well north of, uh, uh, well north of uh, the 20%. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of them, I think, are in the top 10%. So, I mean, you could see why all this talk of the PFD is, is uh, you know, it's personal for them in some ways. Yeah, absolutely, and and this is something I want to say when we come back on air, but but I'll, I'll say it uh, say it also now. It would be a different debate, I think, if we had flat tax or even if you know Willikowski put progressive income tax uh, on the table as part of the discussion. I think it would be a different. It would have a different reaction to von von Im Imhoff and the others would have a different reaction if they saw that there was a significant push toward those sorts of taxes that would affect. Uh, the top 20 percent in the same way that 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 it would affect all other Alaskans. I think they would be more motivated to look for PFD cuts right now. It's a free shot for her. Right. I mean, PFD taxes <coughs> are less than 0 0.02 percent of her family's income. Um, and so she can say she can she can advocate for all of these these in, this increased spending without worrying that she's going to pay any material uh, portion of that. If the debate were instead, any increased spending is going to be covered through a flat tax of 3% on adjusted gross income, that would be a meaningful number uh, for her and her family. And I think the personal motivation would be, well, wait a second, you know, wait, I'm going to have to pay this? Well, then let's let's dig into these costs uh, uh, even more uh, than, we, than we have been, than the administration is, and, and get them down. Having a having a, a a PFD tax be the be the means of raising these additional revenues just lets the top twenty percent you know off the hook and 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 gives them a free shot at looking like good people for you know arguing for continued high spending on the university continued continued spending on K through twelve continued you know Medicaid costs and everything else. You know, you and I continue to talk uh, about the fact that there are plenty of ways and plenty of areas that could still be cut in the budget if we have the political will to do it. I mean, Harold has brought up, I think, a, a variety of great ideas when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, formulas and education. He's talking about, uh, you know, a variety of formulas available to the state to fund education while holding the districts harmless and funding instruction at 65 percent of education spend. There's there's lots of good ideas out there, but it just seems like we continue to be jumping to this issue of it's not a revenue problem or it's not a spending problem. It's a revenue problem. Or in this case, it's a priority problem. Uh, so what do you say to people who could come up to you and just say, hey, we should just cut? Uh, because I think you're right. We should just cut. And I think we could get there with cuts over the course of three years if we really put our minds to it. But uh, unfortunately, you and I keep talking about taxes, like flat taxes and stuff. So what do you say to people who are just saying, well, I'm not even listening to you because we could just cut our way into it, which, again, I think we agree we could. But w what do you tell them? Well, my, my reaction is it, 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 you're right. We could do that. Technically, that's correct. But that's not where the legislature's headed. Um, and in part, the legislature's not headed there because they think they can avoid personal taxes by doing it through PFD cuts and pushing the, pushing the brunt of it to middle and lower uh, income Alaska families. Um, it, 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 we are not going to have a good discussion about cuts until, frankly, we have a good discussion about how we're going to how we would pay for this increased spending and push responsibility onto the top 20% as well as everybody else. 
once we have that discussion, I think we get into a better discussion about cuts. But as long as they think the only alternative, the alternative they're going to be successful with is PFD cuts and they avoid personal responsibility, they and their and their donor class avoid personal responsibility for paying for it, they're going to continue to push for increased spending. So I, I cut taxes revenue measures go hand in hand with cuts you've got it you, you've got to talk about taxes and make it clear that any increased spending or any continued spending is going to come at the expense of all Alaskans not just middle and lower income Alaskans then I think we have a better discussion about cuts if we don't put that if we don't get that on the table and they continue to think they're going to be able to do it with PFD taxes then they're going to they're just going to keep talking about increased spending um, and of course, we've also talked about other options as well for revenue. I don't really have time. We've only got 45 seconds here, Brad, if you want to give me a thumbnail, because we've talked about we could even address oil taxes because there's still money on the table, half a billion dollars, 400, 500, 600 million dollars still on the table that we could do to take back as well to help fund the government as well. Is that am I am I misstating it? Well, I'm not sure it's that high, but there are I mean, there are adjustments we could make. We, we probably should be looking at with respect to oil taxes, um, and yeah, I I think we ought to have a hearing. Okay, frankly, about about all revenue options. Returning now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're on the weekly top three. We were on number two of the weekly top three, where we were talking about all this discussion of revenue, and yet uh, Senator Natasha von Inhofe and others, but has been unceasingly and hugely self-serving, which we haven't touched on yet in an attempt to preempt any discussions of other revenues with a discussion about the PFD. It seems like every time we turn around, she's talking about, uh, you know, how the PFD uh, is is just right for the taking. Why aren't we just plucking at that grape? Uh, and in fact, her comment the other day is this is what a budget looks like when, you know, you want us to give you a full PFD. You're not giving us anything. That is our money. The government got their share already. What you want to do is tax us uh, some more. And uh, it's hugely self-serving for her uh, and others in the legislature, I think, Brad, especially since a, a significant portion of our legislature are in the top 10 percent income earners in the state of Alaska. There is a significant portion. And and the PFD, uh, it, cutting the PFD is a regressive tax, which means it hits middle and lower income Alaska families much harder than it hits upper Alaska families. I did an analysis last year based upon Senator von Imhoff's uh, 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 filings, uh, legislative filings uh, of her own personal financial position, the required filings, and a PFD cut to her family was like less than 0.02 percent uh, of their income. So when she's talking about all we need to do is cut the PFD and we'll pay for government that way, she's talking about something that is meaningless. Uh, for her personally, it's like a free shot. She, uh, <coughs> excuse me, gets to talk about, you know, increased spending and 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 be the nice guy with the K through 12 crowd, the Medicaid crowd, the health health system crowd, uh, and the university crowd about, you know, we're going to maintain, we need to maintain spending there, um, and we're going to do it through PFD taxes, but without her having any personal stake in the game because PFD taxes affect uh, uh, the top 20 percent. Um, uh, so nominally. So I think it's a different, the reason I want to put other revenue items, other revenue uh, 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 means of, of raising new revenue on the table is I think that affects her judgment and I think it affects the judgment of those others in the top 20%. I think it's a different thing if when she's talking about increased spending or maintaining spending, I think it's a different thing to her if she if 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 she's confronted with the fact you would have to pay 2% of your income or 3% of your income uh, along with the rest of Alaskans on it through a flat tax. You would have to pay that amount uh, for these increased spending items. And it, and it becomes more real to her and, more, and, and as importantly, her donor class, who are similarly in the top 20%. It becomes oh the reaction is oh wait I have to spend, pay for part of this I'm not going to be able to fund it through PFD taxes that that shove the responsibility to middle and lower income Alaska families I'm going to have to pay for part of this well wait a second let's go in through let's go into K through 12 let's talk about administrators let's go into the university let's talk right. about you know their FTE spending let's go into Medicaid let's go let's talk about you know the the high cost of Medicaid uh, in this state it 
if if you're able to have a, a if you're able to to put revenue measures on the table that affect all, all Alaskans the same have a, a, the same percent of their income they all come to the table they will all come to the table to talk about finding spending cuts as long as you're allowing for some group to be a free rider uh, and that's what PFD cuts do. They allow the top 20% to be free riders to get government goods essentially for by not paying anything toward them uh, or a nominal percent of their income toward them. As long as you have a, a system that allows free riders, the free riders are going to say, hey, doesn't affect me. Give me more government. Give me more K through 12. Give me more university. Give me more uh, uh, Medicaid. And, and and I think that's the that's the problem of this sort of revenue free zone we've created um, because we're not, we're not discussing it. We're allowing those in the top 20% to set the terms of the debate uh, and say, uh, we're not going to pay for it. So yeah, let's, 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 we're not going to have to pay for it through PFD cuts. So yeah, let's, uh, let's increase spending. Yep. And uh, a balanced solution as Harold says, requires an examination of one, all revenue and two, all expenditures, oil, education, healthcare, everything needs to be on the table period. I think that that pretty much sums up what we're talking about right there. Yeah. And we're not, and we're not going to get that. We're not going to get that. As long as we, as long as the only thing on the table is PFD taxes, and I know there are people in the chat room. I know there are people that read uh, uh, the Sustainable Budgets Facebook site uh, that that just you know go ballistic every time I bring up revenue items. But if we don't bring those up, we're just seeding the field. We're allowing those who are you know advocates for PFD cuts just to have a field day. Uh, and and continue to talk about that as the only option, trying to make it, trying to preempt the field and make it the de facto option uh, because nobody else is talking about anything, any other alternatives. Let's move on to number three because I don't want to run us out of time. Um, on elimination of the Power Cost Equalization Fund, which is a designated fund in the side the state budget, uh, which means, I mean, there are no there are no designated funds, but it's a dedicated fund account uh, that basically has the name Power Cost Equalization on it. And what that means is they don't have to fight uh, to put to uh, spend money out of that account. They don't have to fight with other UGF unrestricted general fund offers to be able to make it happen. And just to show how much the business as usual is running strong in the uh, in the government right now, you've got a, a variety of quotes here for number three from Matt Buck. Over at uh, Midnight Sun, uh, where you know Lyman Hoffman, I think it's a major mistake. Von Imhoff, I think we'd be cutting off our nose to spite our face. And Peter Machicki saying, "Have you considered eliminating the Department of Commerce?" I mean, really? I mean, this is the what the heck is going on here? Yeah, I could see this coming. In fact, I think I, I mentioned it when uh, we had this whole debate about about the administration combining DGF into UGF, because what that does is 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 put light on some of these DGF and, and quote, other pots of money uh, that have been out there historically that have just sort of operated off to the side without the light of day on them. The, the, the PCE fund is one of those. We have put roughly a billion dollars, a little bit short of a billion dollars, but roughly a billion dollars in a savings account. We've put the name PCE on it, a power cost equalization on it. Uh, and the earning, and, it, and that account's invested. It's like a little mini permanent fund. That account's invested and it's spinning off earnings, um, and those earnings are then dedicated, de designated, excuse me, designated to uh, the power cost equalization payments and community revenue sharing. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think uh, the the fund grew so big and the earnings from the fund were so large that they were that 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 they were bigger than power cost equalization. So rather than rather than cut the fund back or use a portion of the earnings to support the general fund, what they did, what Lyman did, was was shift uh, the the community revenue sharing in under that fund and started soaking up a portion of those revenues to go to community revenue sharing and essentially take that out of the budget because it had been cut a few times when we looked at when we looked at the at, when we had uh, budget crises. So. They've 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 shifted these 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 little pots of money off into dark corners, call them designated general funds or other, uh, and taken them out of the out of the light of day, and 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 now what the administration is doing is bringing them back out into the light and saying, look, uh, they have to compete. These funds, uh, these 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 uses of funds 
have to compete with everything else uh, for, uh, uh, for, for spending. I mean, if you're, if you're worried about K through 12 spending, why don't we use the PCE money? If that's a priority, why don't we use the PCE money to support K through 12 spending, right. to support general spending <clears throat> as a, as opposed to PCE. The, the really, the really bad thing about that, or the really, I mean, where you, where you really, where, where ledge, fi, ledge finance is part of this deal. I mean, ledge finance comes across as we're nonpartisan, you know, we're just looking at the numbers. We're, we're even handed guys. What what's really bad about this deal is that the that the PFD was designated was it was in the designated general fund category until a couple of years ago, and it it, it fits the designated fund category. It was left off to the side along with PCE and the other things, um, and, and left out of the left out of the conversation uh, because of that. But a couple of years ago, uh, the 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 chairs of the finance committees on both the House and the Senate side, particularly pushed being pushed by the Senate side. Senator Kelly uh, and uh, and Senator uh, uh, McKinnon uh, pushed to, to move uh, the PFD from DGF from one of these dark corners out to UGF, right, uh, and make it part of the general fund. It's still it, there's nothing about the PFD that changed. It still meets the definition of DGF. Uh, it it is a statutorily designated use. Uh, of of, an, of a revenue stream, right. but they just moved it over to UGF and bring it out into the light. So it's just it's just hugely uh, ironic, and and to those who know what's going on, <laughs> hugely hugely amusing to see PCE brought out into the light. You uh, and all of a sudden, oh my God, you know we can't do that. It's, yeah. it's for a designated use. You call it ironic, I call it hypocritical. But hey, that's just me. You know, Brad, I I I watch this, and all I can think of is. My gosh, this so aligns with the governor's philosophy that he laid out in factoring this budget is that, you know, we need to do a zero-based budgeting and every dollar spent needs to be justified. And essentially what things like the PCE and more do is they take those things out of that factoring, out of that equation. They don't have to justify it. It's just in the account. We're just going to spend it. Um, and if it's good for the goose, as you said, just talking about the DGF uh, permanent fund issues, then it should be good for the gander. But it, it, like you said, it is this hypocrisy of, oh, well, we could, we need to do it over. Oh, but we can't do it for that because that's government money. Wait a second. It, he, he, first of all, it's not. But, you know, OK, if you're going to play that game, then what's good for the goose is good for the goose. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we've, we've got a legislature that knows they that knows they need new revenue to fund the things that that's, that that they want to keep funding to respond to the teachers on K through 12 to respond to the healthcare community on Medicaid, which is frankly just a big subsidy to the health to the Alaska healthcare industry, and and to respond to the university uh, uh, to, to the university's desire for increased funding. They know they need new revenue to do that, uh, but they don't want their little pots of money that they've worked so hard, that Lyme has worked so hard to squirrel away on PCE over the years. They don't want their little pots of money disturbed. Instead, they just want to take it <coughs> from PF, from the PFD and, and you know, and tax Alaskans, tax middle and lower income Alaskans heavily uh, in order to pay for these things. And that's, and, and that's the direction they're going down. We need to, just like we've needed to shine a light on PCE by bringing it out into you know, combining DGF and UGF and not allowing anybody to squirrel things away, just like we're doing that, we need to shine a light on what they're doing with PFD taxes and how they're trying to shift costs to middle and lower income Alaskans and avoid the top 20%. The way to do that is to have is to have a discussion about other revenue options and show that there are revenue options that would affect all Alaskans the same and give all Alaskans the same incentive uh, to re to reduce spending instead of allowing them to just keep getting away with talking about PFD cuts only and saying it's a it's a priority it's a priority crisis we're going to benefit from shining the light more brightly uh, in on revenue options uh, the same way we're benefiting I think from shining the light more bright brightly on these things that they've squirreled away in DGF well the thing that it really brings to mind is the fact that the PCE is is really the big dog in the room it's one of the largest DGF funds out there. Um, but it does raise the question of how many other little pots of money are squirreled away in the closet? You know, remember when we found $236 million in the couch cushions here a couple of years ago because, oh, we forgot that it was in this other fund and blah, 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 and all of a sudden, hey, look, surprise 
money. I mean, how many other pots of money with, with millions and millions and millions of dollars are laying around out there? You know, we're not serious about this yet. That's the problem. The, the legislature, in my opinion, is just not taking a look at this, coupling this with number one and number two, and now top number three, the top, top three. It just shows me that these people are not that serious about it. They want to continue as business as usual, like it's all going to go, just keep going swimmingly. And that's just not the way, it's not the way it's going to work out. Well, it shouldn't be the way it works out. But I mean, the last two years, the legislature has cut the PF, has cut the PFD. They've implemented a PFD tax in order to keep the, the party going. Yeah. We've got a diff- different governor. This governor has a veto pen. And and the end game here is going to be the governor saying, I want the PFD back on the table. I want it fully funded. <coughs> and I'm going to use my veto pen if we can't come to some accommodation to try to force you force you to do that. The end game is going to be fascinating uh, that we're coming to. But but to get to that end game, to set up for that end game, we need to get a, a light out there on, on things like what's going on over the next 10 years. To, to add context to why we need to be making cuts now, and we need to be talking about other new revenue options to, to get light on the fact that uh, that the PFD cuts just you know shove the shove the responsibility to middle and lower income Alaskans and let the top 20% skate, and to to have other revenue options out there to show the top 20% they're going to have to pay too if we don't uh, if we're not able to reduce spending. Well, uh, the more I look at this, uh, I look at all these things going on, and and uh, and I look at the commentary from our various legislators, and I just think nobody, nobody, they just want they want it to be business as usual, and that just drives me crazy. And the fact that we're going to sit back and take it is driving me crazy as well. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Links at the top of the page here in the chat room if you want to go back up to the description of the video. Brad, I appreciate you coming in, my friend. It's good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.